All right, here's the deal. This video's got 10 tips in it, which means it's probably gonna be long as hell, so I'm not wasting time on this intro. If you didn't catch my top 10 novice tips, link will be up here, or here, wherever it goes. This one's for intermediates. How do I find intermediates? Who cares? Can you still watch this even if you aren't an intermediate? Sure, you can still watch this even if you don't lift. I'm taking all the views I can get at this point. Timestamps for each of the tips will be in the description, so long as I remember to do that. If you understand one thing about fitness adaptation, it should be specificity. Meaning if you want the fastest, most bang for your buck progress physically possible, the movements that you select as well as the actual programming that you choose should be as specific to the goal that you have as possible. So if you want a stronger squat, you should be squatting. If you want a stronger bench press, you should be benching. If you're trying to get better at running, you should be running, so on and so forth. Going right along with specificity in movement selection, you'd have specificity in your programming as well. So if you had a hypertrophy goal, you'd be looking at much higher volume as well as focus on time under tension. Whereas you had that pure strength goal, you'd be looking at increased intensity, probably a bit lower volume, and maybe even sport specific singles if you're in the sport of powerlifting. I think most people understand this concept and it's one of the closest things we have to a truth in the fitness world, so hold on to it. That being said, there is a catch. One of the best questions I've been asked is, if specificity is so important, why don't we just squat, bench, and deadlift every single day? Why do we even bother with these variation exercises at all? The short answer to this is you can do just that. You can just squat, bench, and deadlift every single day. In fact, you'll see a lot of higher level powerlifters who are extremely rigid and how specific they are to their sport. They'll only train the squat, bench, or deadlift and extremely close variations thereof. And this is fine. This is simply intelligent training. They want to be the best of the best so they stay as specific to their sport as they possibly can be. But for a lot of people, this can end up having adverse effects on their training where they're doing the same thing over and over again every single day and they end up hating coming to the gym. Understand that while specificity is extremely helpful while designing programs, you don't have to be 100% optimized 100% of the time. You never want to be running yourself into the ground for the sake of specificity and those variation movements can just increase the amount of fun you have with training and increase your longevity in the gym. By far one of the easiest ways to increase progress on a movement is to simply increase the frequency to which you do that movement. You'll see the question all the time, so and so lift is stuck, what do I do? Start by addressing how many days a week you actually train this lift. So if you're only training this lift once a week, increase it to two times a week. If you're only training it two times a week, increase it to three times a week. For more advanced lifters, you will see frequency up to four to five training sessions per week, especially movements like the bench press where your body can just handle that load. You'll attenuate stress for the increased frequency simply by decreasing the intensity of that day that you're adding. So the RPE or the percentage for the day is going to be decreased compared to that first day in the week. Likewise, you can also choose variations for these added days that automatically force load off the bar. So if you added a second squat day in, it could be a tempo squat day, which is going to make the load on the bar less. You're still going to get the stress you need, the stimulus you need, but the load on the bar is going to be less and this just helps attenuate fatigue overall. The other thing people will do is just go beltless for the second or third days. And again, it's just to decrease the amount of load on the bar and make sure that this increased frequency doesn't end up beating you down. This is a much more reliable way to increase progress in a lift as compared to adding smaller accessory movements that aren't actually the movement you want to increase. I.e., if you want your bench press to increase, adding more sets of bench press into your training is gonna be more lucrative than adding in sets of tricep extensions. Can you still have those smaller accessory exercises in your programming? Of course. Just understand when we're talking most bang for our buck, the more specific exercise is going to win. Also, we're not shooting to go full send mode and just start squatting seven days a week. You're shooting for the minimal amount of stress you need to develop an adaptation. So if you're squatting two times a week and you're still seeing progress squatting two times a week, just chill there. Once that stops being the case, that's when you come back to the drawing board and consider adding some extra volume, extra frequency. All too often you'll hear lifters that have only been lifting for three to five years say things like, dude, I am so plateaued right now. I haven't hit a PR in months. Those gains just don't come as easy as they used to. If you are truly an intermediate lifter, I can almost guarantee that you're not actually plateaued. 
Some variable in your training is probably just slightly off, and instead of looking for the voodoo magic quick fix, you just need to be honest with yourself and address the fact of, do I have all of the basics that make up fitness adaptations covered? Here's some of the usual suspects. If I see you max your deadlift one more time this week, I'm taking away your ammonia. Bruh, don't be such a narc. And you, I haven't seen you go over a quarter plate on squats in over a month. What's going on? Oh, uh, I didn't want to fry the old CNS. You know how that is. Get the fuck out. Go to sleep. You're either watching some stupid shit on YouTube like mating rituals of penguins or some bullshit, or you're binging Netflix for the thousandth time like you told yourself you wouldn't. Go to sleep. Damn. You're 6'5 and 160 pounds. Yes, there's a reason you can't bench 315, you giraffe looking like motherfucker. Where did you even get this? The super strong dude DM me on Instagram said I could have it for free so long as I tag him in my Instagram posts. You should see him, man. He's fucking stacked. There's no movements here. It just says five. Take in a deep breath. Now breathe out. Just feel the fucking nonsense float away. Yeah, no, I get that there are carbs in beer. That's not exactly what I meant by refeed. Obviously, there's more I could have pointed out. The main point here is if you only have a handful of years under your belt in training and progressing is feeling like pulling teeth, you probably aren't plateaued. You just have one of those core tenets of training slightly off. You don't need a shiny new supplement. You don't need a quick fix tip from some quack on the internet. You just need to address the fact that do I have all of my basics covered and am I covering them consistently on a daily basis? Easily one of the best things I think's happened for the fitness industry is pain science getting a bit more of a prominent position in the industry. Look, aches and pains as well as injury is just a fact of life if you train for enough years regardless of how good you are with technique or training principles. And understanding the most recent pain science literature is really important for getting you through these situations. Because when you look at the pain science research that we do have versus the culturally accepted information and kind of culturally accepted ways about going through pain, it's, it's bad guys. It's really fucking bad. And I get it because I myself used to be part of spreading that bad information. Thankfully it was before I had a YouTube channel or before I cared about social media in general, but there are people in prominent positions with enough influence and they are still spreading this bad information and it hurts every single time to hear it. While I obviously can't cover everything about pain science in a minute, here's some big things we get culturally wrong. First one would be that if you are experiencing pain, that that means something is mechanically wrong with your body, something's jacked up, you have torn something, you're broken, which is completely false. Experiencing pain does not automatically mean something is wrong with your body, and in many cases you will see people that do experience pain when their body is completely healthy. This can be extremely helpful from a coach's perspective in reassuring people when they're going through pain because in a lot of cases, the actual experience of the pain can be much, much worse than what is actually going on, and the person is not necessarily broken. Our current medical mindset can also fail us when it comes to pain and injuries in multiple ways, but on a basic way you'll see is when someone is injured, you'll hear a doctor say, well, just don't move, don't exercise for a month, then come back and see me. And this is problematic because we know for a fact that movement of an injured area as well as getting that blood flow to the injured area can be crucial in getting it to heal and not moving can end up increasing instances of pain for the individual in question. And then overall, we have created this cultural fear and avoidance of certain movement patterns such as spinal rotation or even simple back extension. And people are expecting from these movements that they will automatically get injured if they put themselves into those positions. You'll hear it all the time whenever someone someone goes to pick up a box, whenever someone goes to shovel some snow, lift with your legs. Because we have this cultural fear that if we use our backs, we are going to injure them. This information can be a mental lifesaver for you and your training, and it's one of the things I'm most passionate about, so I highly suggest looking into this. As a competent lifter, you should have some grasp of how programming works, at the very least so you can understand when you're being presented with a bullshit program or not. In my opinion, the easiest way to learn programming is to look at a bunch of programs that already exist 
and then look for those patterns of, okay, how do they treat movement selection? How do they treat how much volume they gave this person? How do they treat the intensity? How do they lay out blocks? How do they lay out the entire program? And you'll pick up on the patterns of how people make programs. I think a big mistake a lot of people make is holding on to one style of programming for dear life as if 531 or starting strength five by five is the only way to program and there's no other possible way we can do this. There is no one definitive way to program and a lot of stuff works, which is why I suggest looking into all of the examples available to you. There are so many free programs available to you right now. You just have to go out and look for them. From there, I just suggest guinea pigging programming on yourself. If you have friends that are interested, you can give it to them for free to test out. And don't worry about it being perfect from the first time. I guarantee it's not going to be. As with any skill, you're gonna do a lot of things wrong before you start doing anything right. If you want proof of that, just go watch my first video and then come back to this one. The big beginner programming thing I'll tell you to watch out for right off the bat is a beginner programmer almost always puts way too much shit in a program. They're trying to be a power lifter and increase their one rep maxes while getting lean and getting aesthetic like a bodybuilder and also trying to hit a five minute mile on the side. You gotta understand that there's no way to program to hit every single goal you could possibly have at once. And every program you make, regardless of how good it is, will always have its pros and will always have its cons. It can seem tempting to try and program for multiple things at once, but you just end up half-assing all of them instead of seeing solid progress in one area. Also good to note is there's always individual response to certain stimuli. So individual A could do really, really well in the program and individual B could absolutely hate it and see not much progress at all. That's always gonna happen. To be good at programming for other people, you really need to get good at understanding what they respond to well. That's why it's good to stay with coach for a little while and not bounce around between coaches because in theory, the more they get to know you, the better the programming should get. As with a lot of skills, you're not gonna learn this one unless you do it, and trying and failing is just part of the game. So if you're really interested in programming, just start doing it, guys. Don't worry about it being perfect. Just start writing it and testing it out, both on yourself and possibly on a few friends. Just be careful. First thing I always like to explain is I am 100% cool with you doing whatever diet helps you feel good, you can adhere to it, and it helps you hit your goals. I do not care what diet you're on. That being said, as a coach, when I hear someone tell me that they are on the keto diet, carnivore diet, paleo diet, you name the fad diet, I don't care. My first thought goes to, this person probably doesn't understand the basic tenets of nutrition. And that's a big assumption on my part. I can definitely be wrong with this, but a lot of people fall into these diets because they're just damn easy to follow. Just don't eat that food or only eat this food and you'll lose weight. You don't actually have to learn any of the tenets of basic nutrition, which I get everyone wants the easiest options available. My thing is understanding enough nutrition information to basically tailor make your own diet and eat whatever foods you want to eat is pretty easy actually. Biggest thing you need to understand is your daily maintenance calories, which is just how many calories you burn in a day. If you don't know that number, go to Google right now and just type in energy expenditure calculator. Don't worry which one it is, they all use the same formula and that'll give you a rough estimate. From here to hit any nutrition goal you have, if you want to lose weight, you simply have to eat under this daily maintenance number. If you want to gain weight, you have to eat over that daily maintenance number. And if you just wanna stay the same body weight, obviously you'd eat right at that number. I will generally tell people to either do 200 to 300 calorie deficits or surpluses if you want slow, sustainable progress in either weight gain or weight loss and 500 calorie deficits or surpluses if you want a bit accelerated progress, but it may be a bit harder to handle. And then from there, everyone always asks about macros and macros are a bit more loose and friendly than I think a lot of people are aware of. The biggest one to know is the protein number and I'm gonna link you guys to a video by Dr. Eric Helms, but carbs and fats you can largely tailor make to your liking. So the macronutrient balance, so how many protein you ate, how much carbs you ate, and how much fat you ate largely does not matter in terms of losing weight or gaining weight. Uh, protein matters in you know, muscle building processes and recovery, but the carbs and the fats, you can be in a pretty wide range with those. People believe those macros are influencing how much weight they gain or lose, when in reality, it's just that calorie number for the day. So if you are in a calorie deficit, guaranteed you're gonna lose weight, doesn't matter what macros you're eating. If you're in a calorie surplus, guaranteed you're gonna gain weight, doesn't matter what macros you're eating. And boom, just like that, you can manipulate your body weight up, down, left, right, and sideways. No other information compares to understanding that you need a deficit to lose weight, surplus to gain weight. 
nothing else matters as much as that does. Probably one of the hardest things I see intermediates trying to come to grip with is riding that fine line of caring about technique and trying to improve it versus becoming downright obsessive to the fact that it starts hurting their training. Technique and form proficiency is great and something we should strive for. It makes movements in the gym easier for us to do, lets us lift the most amount of weight possible, and lets us get the desired stimuluses we want out of exercises. However, a lot of lifters get so caught up in chasing technique perfection that they become almost robotic in their movements, and any slight deviation requires a complete deload of the bar to fix. Or, and what I think is more prevalent, is they start fixing issues that aren't even there. This can become exacerbated by overzealous coaches, and as a coach myself, I get it. You can feel like you're not doing your job if you're not saying anything, but in a lot of cases, there is nothing to say. In fact, overcuing your athlete to the point of them overthinking the lift entirely is going to hurt their progress, and as a byproduct, it's making you a less effective coach. Small technique issues like minor knee cave, maybe an elbow's out of position, or maybe the bar is even slightly off kilter, are non-issues, especially if we consider anything remotely close to maximal effort. These issues are not signs of major imbalances in your body, they don't require you adding in a bunch of accessory exercises that you don't need, and they also don't require you completely deloading the bar and starting from scratch to learn good technique. Proper technique with heavy weight is learned by doing proper technique with heavy weight, and your technique sets at 50%, as well as your 30 sets of hip extensions because your knees caved in one degree on that squat are not the solution. Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't put every rep and set you do under the microscope and understand that it takes years upon years to get anywhere close to perfect reps under maximal intensity in this sport. And it's just like a general life tip, probably disregard any technique advice you get in a comment section. Actual coaches aren't sitting there wasting their time typing that stuff out. This can obviously apply to more than just lifting, but I believe that the actual environment that you're in is an underappreciated fact of lifting and your training environment can definitely, definitely play a role in how much progress you see and just the type of lifter you end up being. I understand that not everyone is lucky enough to have access to a lion's den or untamed strength or never stay near them, but having that spot where the people, one, lead the life that you wanna lead and two, are potentially at a strength level that is wildly higher than yours, can be huge for your training. At first, you might think it'd be discouraging to be in an environment where people could be outlifting you by 200 pounds, but the type of progress you see when you're exposed to that is insane. Being that small fish in a big pond can be a huge check to the ego where it's like, okay, I have not achieved the peak of my training and there's so much more I'm capable of doing. And if you're in a gym with solid community, you're also going to be able to learn the tips that got them to where they're at directly from them. There's still a lot of lifting information that's just passed on by word of mouth and doesn't really make it onto YouTube. A good example of this is all of my strongman tips, techniques, strategies, all of that. It's just because we have so many competitors rolling through the gym at any given time. There's not really a whole bunch of strongman information on YouTube right now. And then very obviously a good training environment can make those tough training days where you don't wanna go train much easier easy to show up to a gym with a bunch of friends as opposed to going to your lonely squat rack in your commercial gym and staring directly at the wall in front of you. I think if asked, most of us would agree that we wanna be in this game for the long term and we want our body to be in commission as long as physically possible so we can continue to train as long as physically possible. Don't think there are too many people that would disagree with that. Above everything, if you want to achieve longevity in lifting, you have to enjoy the process of lifting itself. Everyone gets caught up on, oh, if I just hit this number in the gym, if I just get this many inches on my biceps, if I just lose this much weight and hit this goal body weight, I'm gonna be happy. And those numbers don't really exist. I myself remember thinking, man, when I can just rep out two plates on the bench, that's gonna be so cool. When I can squat four plates for reps, that's gonna be 
awesome. And now it's just something I do in training and it's just part of the daily routine. And yes, as with anything, you're going to have that brief moment of satisfaction, that brief moment of euphoria for hitting these kind of, you know, check marks or goals, but that euphoria is going to fade and you're right back to reality. So if you're not enjoying the entirety of the process in between those goals, you're kind of in trouble for enjoying this as a whole. And then right alongside of this for increasing longevity in the gym is just being patient. We can achieve a lot of really cool fitness adaptations, giving a proper stimulus, and then even more important is the correct amount of time. All of us get super caught up in how can I achieve this faster? How can I improve this progress? This is not happening quick enough. And then we kind of mentally tank ourselves or we push our progress so much that we end up injuring ourselves. If you're deep into the competitive side of this sport, sure, you're gonna be tiptoeing this line, but there's a difference between tiptoeing the line and being 100 fucking meters downrange. We are all lifting arbitrary amounts of weight through arbitrary amounts of space and time. It's not that deep, bro. Just chill the hell out. Enjoy the process, the gains will come. And finally, never stop trying to be better at what you do. The second you're sitting there thinking, man, I know it all, is the exact second you turn into the dogmatic old geezer spouting off bro science to the teen that didn't ask for it at the YMCA. The information for this field is only going to get better with time and if you're stuck holding on to ideas from 20 years ago, it's only gonna be hurting you. Even just thinking about my brief stint in strength training, the information you would get from fitness personalities five years ago compared to what you'd get now is drastically different. And that's a great thing. We've gotten much more efficient in understanding what information we need to know, what's actually important to improving progress, and what we can kind of throw away to the wayside. You'll see YouTubers all the time outright say that they do not agree with things they have said in videos from years ago, and that's 100% how it should be, just constant growth and evolution. There's a dangerous point in every intermediate training career where they've learned just enough information to think they know it all, and I'm telling you right now, your brain is lying to you. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There's always gonna be something more you can learn. There's always going to be something you can be better at. Never let yourself halt your progress, and keep chasing the brain gains. Holy fuck, we made it. Okay, that was that was a lot of information, guys. I, I've been sitting here for way too long talking to a camera. Uh, if you liked the video, please, Put a like on the video, comment, subscribe, all that stuff helps me out a lot. Um, thanks so much if you made it this far. This is probably gonna be probably gonna be a long one. So do appreciate all you guys watching. Do appreciate all you guys that support the channel. Hope to see y'all in some future content. Thanks so much, guys. I'll catch y'all later.